Hey, this is Donna Lewis and welcome to Breathe Life Ministries. Um, we're going to talk about some stuff today. Uh, before we get rolling, I would like to encourage you to tune in. This is an important discussion. Um, if you have been in an abusive relationship, either as a child, um, in the form of domestic violence taking place between your parents, and that includes emotional violence, that includes emotional abuse. Um, just because somebody doesn't walk away with a black eye doesn't mean they're not being abused. And we're going to talk about that more. Um, so if you've been, um, if you are the adult child uh, of, or, you know, a child uh, growing up in an abusive situation, if you are currently experiencing an abusive situation, if you have recently or in the past walked away from an abusive relationship, um, I want you to tune in and I want you to share this with your community. We're going to have a really important discussion here. Um, and it's a challenging one. The reason I'm going ahead and uh, changing my uh, original scheduled format for today, I was going to be doing the book of uh, Ezekiel study today, but this is going to have to take precedence over that. Um, many of you are watching the news and many of you like myself are very disturbed by what we're seeing. Uh, we just recently discovered that a young woman, her life was cut short um, by most likely an abusive relationship that she was in with her boyfriend. Um, and the police somehow missed the opportunity. They, they tried, but they missed the opportunity to save her life. I can't imagine what those police officers are feeling today. Um, that's gotta be awful. Um, I can't imagine what her parents are feeling today uh, because they somehow missed the signals of what was going on. But see, this is the nature of abuse. It, it puts on a pretty face, doesn't it? It puts on its public face. And it, it looks like there's no problems here, that everything is great. But they don't see what's going on underneath the surface. And we're going to talk more about that. So what I want you to do, um, if you would, please, because this is such an important subject, and we're going to be getting into some things that by God's grace will empower people to escape, to get out. Um, so let me just see here. I'm, I'm using uh, Zoom again, <laughs> if, you, if, uh, if you're not uh, aware of that. And um, the Zoom does make it a little more challenging for me to um see when y'all are making comments so what i am going to do is just bring up the facebook page and hopefully i will be able to see your comments because honestly and truthfully i do very much want your comments in this discussion and i'm also going to try and share this um, on my page so people can see it there we 
go. And let me just take one more quick check here to see. Okay. All right, well, like I said, this makes it tough as far as being able to see the comments. If y'all are commenting, um, I am very thrilled that you're commenting. Unfortunately, the Zoom app, I don't get to see the comments come up um, the way I do on my other format. Um, so, and I'm just trying to, I'm trying a bunch of different things here. So just bear with me and we're gonna get into the discussion. Um, again, while I am adjusting this, if you would, share this video and uh, allow other people to that uh, that um, have been in this relation in, in this kind of a relationship um, abusive relationship to participate in the discussion um if you've got people that you know that are battling this right now um please again share this and we are going to get rolling on the discussion here very shortly okay gang well i'm struggling to be able to see your comments so we're just gonna let that go and dive in to the discussion so what exactly is the discussion okay well and pardon me um my brain is a little bit foggy um it's a tough subject for me um talking about this um uh because i've been there now the the form of abuse that i experienced uh was emotional abuse um I was in a toxic relationship uh, for 10 years and um, it was a challenging form of abuse because it was not overt. In other words, it wasn't face slaps and things like that. It wasn't shouting and screaming and hollering and name calling. It wasn't any of that. It was very subtle, subtle programming. For me, my experience, um, he would freeze me out, just freeze me out, ignore me like I wasn't even in the room. Um, I mean, or he would acknowledge me, but I was frozen out. I would I would go to hug him and he would just stiffen up and not allow it. And then kind of push me away and ask me why I was so clingy. Um, he would uh, not be intimate with me. He would complain that my breath stank he would um apologize for me uh, if we were in a crowd uh, if we were in a social gathering and i would be engaging in the conversation he would make apologies for me um he would say things like uh, he would use the stuff he was learning in psychology because he was uh, studying uh, to be a biblical counselor at our Bible college. And he would, he would use what he was learning to diagnose me. Um, and subtly 
in that which was programming me to believe that I had mental dysfunctions. He would undermine how I viewed my intelligence by saying things like, you display all the same traits as my clients. Well, his clients were developmentally delayed adults who were married and he was one of their life counselors. So he would go in and he would help them manage their um, checking account and get their grocery lists. Um, and many of these clients also had children, right? And um, so his, his exact words were more like, you display all of the same traits as the children of my clients. <sighs> In other words, my brain was underdeveloped. Um, he made comments to the effect of he would be okay if I died. He wouldn't be okay if his uh, best friend in school died. He'd be sad if he died, but if I died, he'd be okay. So in other words, the programming was my life did not matter. Um, so all of this was, but you know, he was always very understated, right? There was very little emotion displayed by him. So I didn't recognize what was happening to me. And I didn't understand why I was feeling so starved emotionally i didn't understand why i felt so miserable um i also didn't recognize the abuse because i was comparing it to the abuse i experienced in my uh parents relationship my parents' relationship was much different in that my father was extremely loud. He would shout, he would curse, he would rage. Uh, he never raised a hand to my mother. He never struck her with his hands or physically became violent with her. But his words and the way he would rage was every bit as terrifying as though he was beating her with his fists. He would call her names. He would curse at her. He would curse at me and my brother. He would just constantly rage. So I didn't understand in the relationship I had with my first husband that I was being abused because I was comparing it to the other relationship of my parents, right? And um, I somehow, you know, didn't think that yeah. it was the same thing, right? I didn't think that the abuse was the same. Um, I didn't recognize it. So the first thing that I want to empower you, the listener, is that abuse does not have to be loud. Abuse does not have to be physical to be abuse. A person can cut another person down to the core of their being in very polite language, in very quiet, calm, perfect English, perfect command of literary verse and yet cut that other human being down below the core of their identity and destroy it. 
abuse can and often is very loud. It's shouting, it's hollering, it's screaming, ranting and raving, pounding the table with the with fists, throwing furniture, pounding the wall and putting holes through the wall. It can be physical, it can be slaps and punches, pinches, hair pulls, choking, it can be all of that. But don't mistake a calm demeanor for zero abuse. Recognize the emotional impact that it's having on you. Are you experiencing the feeling of being starved? You see, by the end of my 10 year relationship with my first husband, I felt starved to death. I felt emotionally emaciated. I felt so tired I remember thinking to myself, maybe if somebody could just put me into a coma for two years, I would finally feel like I got enough rest. Um, that's what my relationship with my first husband was doing to me. It was it was a slow and steady starving to death. And I, I explained it to one friend, uh, I felt like I was on a slow drip of poison. The second thing that I want to bring out is probably one of the most difficult elements of this. And that is how the church empowers the abuser. This is going to make some of you very angry. Sorry, not sorry. I want you to know this. I love the church. The church is the body of Christ. But the church is made up of human beings. And human beings can be sincerely mistaken. And this is one area where Many in the body of Christ are sincerely mistaken. And I am coming to you today to implore you in the name of Jesus to reevaluate the way you look at marriage. In the Christian relationship, marriage is viewed appropriately as a very high and reverent institution. And it should be. Abuse in the marriage relationship is an adulteration of that relationship. It is a violation of that relationship. It is an abomination to the relationship and the high function, the high institution that it represents. The marriage relationship between a man and wife 
is meant to reflect the union of Jesus Christ to the church. When a husband violates that by brainwashing his wife into believing that she is crazy, she is stupid, she is weak, she is incapable, and she is never enough. He is basically, from where I sit, and I read that scripture, thou shalt not take the Lord thy God's name in vain. That's what I'm seeing. I'm seeing him taking the Lord's name in vain. That's just to be, that's just starters. And how, how do I come to that conclusion? Well, if the husband represents in symbolism, the role or the person of Jesus Christ to the church, i.e. the wife, then when he treats the wife, i.e. the church, with this form of repulsive dishonor, violating the core of who she is as an identity, as, as, as her identity, when he speaks to her in such a way that it makes her believe that she is impure, unreliable, unfaithful. I mean, how is that not taking the Lord's name in vain? He's representing God to her. He is becoming like a priest to her and telling her that God sees her this way. How is that not taking the Lord's name in vain? The other thing that I see going on when a husband mistreats his wife is adultery. He is not honoring this woman as a wife. He is treating her as something less than human. And he's honoring himself. He is behaving in a manner that violates the marriage vows to love, honor, and cherish. And so often, as part of the abuse, comes some form of sensual addiction, sensual addictions to pornography, to looking at other women with lust. Again, I see the violation of adultery taking place in the marriage relationship when the husband dishonors his wife with emotional abuse. The third element that goes into this is that rather than empowering his wife to become all that God created her to be, he is imprisoning it and destroying it. A temple of the Holy Spirit the, that the husband is commissioned by God to honor 
and cherish and build up. He is instead defiling with toxic words and messaging at, at the minimum and with physical violence at the maximum or even as we've seen most recently, murder. Now, where does the church come into this and how, how is it that I am able to say that the church bring, how is it that I'm able to bring a case to the church to, to say that the church is actually empowering this? Well, they do it in a wide range of ways. I can't tell you how many times I have um, had women come to me and share with me their, their heartbreak because they finally came to the place where they're willing to acknowledge that one, they are being abused or something just isn't right in their relationship with their husband. So they go to the church and they explain to whoever is in charge of the counseling, be it the pastor, be it a deacon, be it an associate pastor, be it a women's ministry leader. They share their brokenness. They share their experience and they're seeking help. And here's what the church comes back and says to them. Well, honey, God wants you to be holy, not happy. <sighs> okay. Question number one. How does it make a person holy? How does abuse exactly make somebody holy? How does enduring day in and day out terror that they are going to upset their spouse, how does that exactly make somebody holy? How is that helpful? How does that call the husband to account for his failure to love, honor, and cherish his wife? How does that hold the husband accountable to build his wife up in their most holy faith? The woman walks away from that experience just as perplexed as when she walked in. You don't think maybe she's been praying for her husband enough, quoting scripture to herself enough, What am I suggesting that the church do instead? Well, have an abuse hotline available. And I'm going to put that in the comments, the end of this broadcast. Have an escape plan ready to present to these women that they can actually implement and put into place. If a woman is under so much distress that they have now made the very difficult choice that may have involved a lot of creative planning just to get to that place where they could safely get to the church to even have this conversation with you.
I would recommend that every church leader study the telltale signs, study and learn exactly what is abuse, verbal, emotional, and physical. What are the symptoms of a woman experiencing this form of abuse? What are the telltale signs that the abuser might be putting off when they're in public so that you can begin to discern this in your congregation? Begin talking about it in your, con in your congregation to empower people to recognize the sin of abuse and then provide women with an escape strategy to get out from underneath it. Network with local abuse um, counselors, local abuse rescue organizations. And yes, emotional abuse is every bit as damaging as physical abuse. As a matter of fact, the way I look at it is it's all the reward with none, none of the risks. You see, when a man breaks a woman's face, he has to answer to the emergency room for that. He has to come up with some kind of a excuse for it. A woman with nothing but emotional violence taking place in the home, has no bruises, has no broken bones, and it's only her word against his. It's all the reward for the abuser and none of the risk. He can do every bit as much damage to her soul and spirit without ever leaving a mark. So don't minimize it. Oh, he's just cranky. Oh, honey, just exercise some patience. He's a little crotchety. You know, we don't all get Prince Charming. I have heard that. This isn't about Prince Charming, my friend, or a little bit of occasional disruption in the relationship. This is about a premeditated, sadistic individual getting delight out of the pain they're causing their spouse. It's a sin. It's wrong. And it's equally wrong for the church to come in and minimize it, cover it up, gloss it over, pat the wife on the head and say, go home, just keep praying, honey. You know it's a sin to divorce. It, this has to stop. This really has to stop. And, Finally, I want to make one more plea, and that is on behalf of the children that observe this when they're growing up in this environment. They're learning to internalize abuse as normal that this is just how relationships are. And then they enter into abusive relationships and continue the cycle. If we don't start talking about this in our congregations, we are empowering the enemy to continue his assault on the body of Christ. Think about all of the potential ministry that this little gal, Gabby, 
had inside of her gone. Gone. Think about all the women out there with beautiful ministry deep inside of them that is being silenced because of the abuse they're going through right now. God does not honor abuse in the marriage relationship. God does not will women to remain in these relationships. God takes abuse very seriously. Think about what Jesus said in the Beatitudes. When a man looks at a woman to lust after her, he has committed adultery. When a, when a man says, Raka, you fool, to another person, he's guilty of hellfire. God considers abuse to be extremely serious. He does not want women to stay in these relationships. There is no way for the woman to pray her way out, to read enough scripture, to put enough holy oil, to stop this abuse, the only way it stops is for her to leave. It's, it's not up to the woman to turn her man into a godly human being by staying inside that abusive relationship and allowing her children to constantly be subjected to, to this assault on her character, her nature, her being, her value. Can God heal the abuser? Absolutely. Can the woman still pray for her abuser? Absolutely, and she should but from a different residence, isolated from him, separated from him, not in proximity to him. We have to start telling women it's okay to leave. We have to start empowering women to leave these relationships. If you are in an abusive relationship right now, it's time to leave. It's time to put an end to it by getting out. If Gabby had just stayed with those police officers, she'd still be alive today. It's time, it's time. And it's time for the church to quit enabling this behavior. It's time for the church to quit being silent about it. Men, and there are so many good men out there If you see someone degrading another human being,
Speak out. Speak out. Women, don't be a victim. Pull up your big girl pants. Know this, God is behind you. God is behind you on this. Get out. Don't let it go on another day. There is help available. And I've placed a phone number that you can, um, actually it's a text messaging number so that you don't even have to, you don't even have to pick up the phone and speak into it. You can just text for help. And they'll walk you through a plan to get out. So anyway, um, I know tough subject today. Um, go ahead and place your comments. Um, if you are watching this and you have been um, in a relationship that was abusive, I want to give you a free copy of my book, Toxic to Transformed 100 Words of Life to Renew the Mind, so that you can begin healing. Um, please share this video, like this video, comment on this video, and I will be back next week, back on track with uh, Ezekiel. Um, I guess that's it. <laughs> Just know it's okay to leave. Don't stay in it anymore. Bye-bye.